Good evening. I'm Brent Taylor, convener of the MWHV Spokers Speakers Program. On behalf of myself and our hardworking committee, I welcome you to tonight's event. This evening, we're embarking on the MWHV's second COVID-19 friendly presentation. So far, it's looking promising because of expected to be around 40 guests in the audience tonight. There's a few haven't quite turned up, but that's, here's hoping. First, I'd like to thank everyone who answered our survey at the last session, as nearly a half of last month's audience did. We've listened and we'll share some of the results with you. The most encouraging thing we found was all of you were interested in attending, attending more MH, MWHV Zoom meetings. That's hard to say. Other things of interest were, you prefer Zoom sessions on Tuesday or Wednesday nights, beginning at 7 p.m., just over half of you have served in the military. A further quarter have close relatives who did, while 15% belong to neither group but like military history. There were no serving members of the military in our audience. Some of you had technical issues, not surprisingly, and we think it was probably due to local issues as my experience through the NBN was excellent. Of course, our technical guru, Jason McGregor, did his usual top job. Um, however, my per performance as moderator was rated as, as a bit shaky, so I've been working on that. I hope it shows. Um, best of all, you thought our last speaker, Ross McMullen, was excellent. We try to do our best for you, and I'm sure you'll also find tonight's speaker will do a great job. Tonight, we're pleased to have Robert Hadler presenting Dark Secrets, the true story of murder on the HMAS Australia. A little bit about Robert. He's a former award-winning journalist, award-winning economic journalist and foreign correspondent. He's also worked in the Commonwealth Public Service as a political advisor for industry and lobby groups, and as a senior executive in some of Australia's biggest companies. Since 2015, Robert has been a non-executive director on government, private and not-for-profit boards. His passion is writing about Australian history in particular controversial events that sparked military, legal and political challenges and triggered reforms that changed the future direction of the nation. When Robert finishes his presentation, he'll be answering questions. Um, what, I, what I'd like you to do is send a chat message um, into, into the chat function. You'll see that uh, the the chat icon on the middle bottom of the Zoom panel. Everyone, everyone to send the question to everyone and I'll read the question out at the, when at the appropriate time. Um, by now, you should be on speaker view with your microphone and video off. And I'll now invite Robert Hadler to speak. Thanks Brent. Um, and welcome to the Zoom presentation. If you just, Forgive me, I'm going to do a bit of a slideshow, so there might be a quick technical uh, issue here while we switch over. And Jason, I'm told the host has disabled the participant screen sharing, so you might have to tackle that for me. Ah, yep, there we go. Right, now I'm hoping that everyone can uh, can see the uh, can see the slides. What's happened here? There it is. So look, um, as I said, welcome to this Zoom presentation today about my new book, Dark Secrets. As the heading of the slide states, I believe this is one of the most controversial events in Australian history. Most of this story occurs in the dark days of the war against the Japanese in 1942, but it is a long, complex and emotional story. The story actually starts decades earlier, just as the First World War is ending. Between 1918 and 1922, Three boys were born on the opposite ends of the world in very different circumstances. Ron Gordon, who you can see on the left of the slide, was born in Copnor on the island of Portsmouth 
to a Royal Navy Chief Petty Officer, Albert, and his wife, Mary. He was inseparable from his older brother, Frank, after they moved to Australia in 1927. But Frank was homesick and joined the Royal Australian Navy and then transferred to the Fleet Air Arm as soon as he was old enough. Tragedy struck soon after when both Mary and then Albert, in a matter of days, both died of influenza in 1934. Ron was suddenly left an orphan and decided to follow in his father's and brother's footsteps and joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1936. Unfortunately, we don't have many photos of Ted Elias, who was born in the inner suburb of Sydney to a labourer, Alfred, and his wife, Christina. Unfortunately, Alfred died when Ted was only two and a half and Christina was left a single working mother. Ted grew up in the slums of Sydney during the razor gang wars of the 1920s and the Great Depression in the 1930s. It did not take him long to seek job security in the Royal Australian Navy in 1936. Then Jack Riley was born in the idyllic rural setting of Belle Reve in Hobart in 1922 to a carpenter Victor and his wife Blanche. The family moved to Sydney in 1930 to start a new life and a daughter, Judith, who's seen in the photo with Jack, was born. But dreams of a new life in Sydney were quickly killed off by the Great Depression and the family moved back to Belle Reve. A visit of HMAS Hobart to Tasmania in 1938 quickly sparked Jack's interest in the Navy and he joined the RAN at the age of 16 in 1939. Fate brought these three young men together in the Royal Australian Navy flagship HMAS Australia in September 39. Australia had only just been recommissioned after its first refit since it was uh, floated in 1928. It was our biggest and best warship in World War II. It was just over 10,000 tonnes, which in layman's language is equal to 250 40-tonne semi-trailers. It was very fast with a top speed of 31 and a half knots equal to 55 kilometres per hour. And it was also very powerful with eight main eight inch or 200 millimetre guns. The three stokers had a much better life than their predecessors when warships were coal powered. The first HMAS Australia in World War I used a tonne of coal for every mile travelled and could only sail 3,000 miles before it had to recoil, which was a very dirty and sometimes dangerous job. Warships were fitted with oil burning furnaces in the 20s and 30s, but the furnaces, especially in the tropics, often pushed the temperature in the boiler rooms above 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 49 degrees Celsius. Stokers also lived cheek by jowl in the engine rooms and the mess decks where they also hung their hammocks. There were more than 850 crew in the warship during the war and it was only 214 yards long. That's about 190 metres or a little longer than the MCG. In these cramped, hot and sweaty conditions, petty differences could easily flare into confrontation if the sailors were not closely managed. HMAS Australia and all other RAN warships were placed under the control of the Royal Navy by the Governor General in 1939. This had an immediate impact for RAN sailors as they were placed under Admiralty orders to sail for war in faraway oceans. It also had unforeseen consequences for RAN sailors. If they breached discipline, they would be sentenced under British military law 
and this would be much more severe than Australian regulations. More of this later. After boring convoy duty in the Indian Ocean, HMAS Australia was ordered by the Admiralty to Africa to help the free French liberate Senegal. In its first action of the war, the flagship forced the Fiji French cruiser Glore to, to agree to parole in Casablanca. At this stage, HMAS Australia was a happy and a lucky ship. During the chase, it narrowly avoided colliding with the French cruiser and Vichy French aircraft dropped their bombs well away afterwards. After this first flush of success, the Admiralty ordered HMAS Australia to Britain for a major refit. While it was in dry dock, the flagship had another lucky escape when a thousand tonne German aerial torpedo hit the ship but failed to explode. The Admiralty then ordered the flagship back to West Africa to help with the blockade of Dakar. During the bombardment of Vichy French ships in Dakar, the flagship was damaged by shell fire, but no one was hurt. Another lucky escape. The flagship then sailed to the Indian Ocean to unsuccessfully hunt for a Vichy French convoy and then German raiders in the Great Southern Ocean. Then, suddenly in December 1941, the Admiralty ordered HMAS Australia back to the Australian station as the Japanese advanced down the Asian archipelago. The RAN urgently needed reinforcements after the loss of the cruisers Sydney and Perth and the destroyers Parramatta and Yarra. The RAN only had Australia, its sister ship Canberra and the light cruiser Hobart to defend the Australian continent. And the Japanese were closing in fast and in much bigger ships and numbers. Shortly afterwards, Ron Gordon was shocked to hear that his older brother Frank was missing in action, presumed dead in the North Sea. Ron now had lost all of his family. He turned to his close friend Ted Elias for support. However, Ted was also struggling with his own family issues. His mother Christina had married again to a drifter, Peter Byrne, and Ted suddenly felt very alone. Jack was happy to be at home on leave in Belrive, but he was sick and suffering from damaged eyesight after an accident involving an open furnace door. He simply didn't want to go back to the war. The three sailors were suffering from loss, anger and pain. This was a bad combination of emotions to take back to the war. In January 42, HMAS Australia led Task Force 44, including Hobart and the USS Chicago to the Coral Sea. They were to rendezvous, rendezvous with the US carrier task force and block a Japanese invasion of New Guinea. Tensions were high and emotions were raw. Thursday, 12 March 1942 seemed quiet at first. The flagship Captain Harold Farncombe was in his cabin writing reports. Sailors in the wireless room listened for news of the Japanese invasion fleet. The crew were at second degree readiness, relaxing at their posts at blackout on a very balmy evening. Ron Gordon, Ted Elias and Jack Riley met on the deck. Suddenly Ron Gordon and Ted Elias attacked Jack Riley. In a moment of madness, Ron Gordon and Ted Elias brutally stabbed Jack Riley 14 times and tried to throw him overboard. But after hearing the commotion, shipmates arrived before they could complete the cover-up. Jack Riley was taken below. Before he passed out, he told the ship's surgeon, Malcolm Stenning, that Gordon and Elias had attacked him. Why? Because he had accused them of being homosexual. 
Jack Riley clung to life for over 24 hours before peritonitis from his wounds eventually killed him. He was buried at sea at 1700 Howes on Saturday evening. Ron Gordon and Ted Elias claimed two other sailors had attacked Jack Riley in the dark the previous night, but they were charged with his murder. As Jack Riley was being buried at sea, Labor Prime Minister John Curtin was appealing to Americans to help stem the tide against the Japanese. He decided to make a pact with US General Douglas MacArthur to wage a combined war against the Japanese. It was a pivotal moment when Australia swung from the mother country towards a new ally in the United States. Curtin asked his external affairs minister and attorney general, Bert Evatt, to fly to the US to lobby President Roosevelt for planes, troops, and ships to fight the Japanese. Everett borrowed MacArthur's Catalina flying boat to travel to the US. He actually flew over the Coral Sea at the same time that Jack Riley was being buried at sea. He did not know it then, but British PM Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt had already agreed on a German, Germany first strategy. After Jack's burial at sea, the flagship executive officer, Black Jack Armstrong, seen here on the left, began a third degree interrogation of the crew. He found that Ron Gordon and Ted Elias and others were part of a homosexual group and that the two sailors had killed Jack Riley to hide their sexual activities. In his report on the murder, Squadron Commander Rear Admiral Jack Crace told the Navy Board in Melbourne there was a large nest of immorality on the flagship. The Navy Board in Melbourne was shocked by the reports and agreed that there should be a quick court-martial in Umea. They wanted the flagship free as quickly as possible to take part in any defence against a Japanese invasion. A civil court case would take months and occupy many of the ship's officers and crew, and the Navy Board simply could not sanction that diversion from the fight against the Japanese. The Navy Board decided that a pre-war criminal lawyer, Trevor Rapke, serving in Darwin, should be the sailor's defence lawyer, or the prisoner's friend as it's called in the military. They assumed he would be able to get to New Mea quickly but he actually had to fly from Darwin to Adelaide, then take a train to Sydney before he could catch the former merchant ship, now HMAS Merca, to New Mia. He arrived in Fiji, sorry, he arrived in New Mia on April Fool's Day, just before Easter 1942. The court martial was always going to be a challenge. As the murder occurred at night, there were no direct eyewitness accounts. No murder weapon was ever found. And the Navy simply didn't want to hand the Japanese propaganda by referring to the alleged homosexual motive. Harold Farmkin simply told the panel of junior officers he personally believed that Ron Gordon and Ted Elias were guilty. After five days, the panel found Ron Gordon and Ted Elias guilty as charged, based solely on circumstantial evidence. Trevor Rapke immediately claimed there had been a miscarriage of justice and wanted to lodge an appeal, but there was no appeal under British military law that applied in this court-martial. The death sentence placed the new Labor government in a difficult position. The Navy Minister Norman Macon wanted to support the Navy, but his government was opposed to capital punishment. As a result, Macon ordered the death penalty be put on hold until the government could find a way out of the mess. HMAS Australia was ordered back to Sydney to offload Ron Gordon and Ted Elias into Long Bay Penitentiary. 
The formal excuse was that the flagship needed to replace worn turbine shafts, but Australia was quickly back at sea. Even though Trevor Rapke had clashed with the captain during the court-martial, Harold Farncombe asked him to stay on the flagship as his secretary. The sweetener was that Harold Farncombe would argue for clemency for Ron Gordon and Ted Elias. While the flagship was in Sydney, Trevor Rapke arranged for two legal experts to help Ron Gordon and Ted Elias. A constitutional lawyer, Dr Frank Lewitt, and a former New South Wales Attorney General, David Hall, agreed to what lodge a High Court appeal. It was a long shot, but a worthy delaying tactic to give the government time to stop the death sentence. Four High Court justices heard the case. It only took a morning. The arguments were clear. Either British law applied and the sentences were valid, or there had been a miscarriage of justice and the two sailors should be freed. Unfortunately, the justices would take over two months to formally write their detailed decision. Meanwhile, the flagship was about to face a concerted Japanese attack in the Battle of the Coral Sea. The flagship was heavily bombed, but narrowly avoided being sunk at the hands of Japanese bombers, and both Harold Farncombe and Trevor Rapke lived to see another day. Importantly, Task Force 44 had blocked the Japanese invasion of New Guinea. In the east, the US Navy and Japanese fought a very intense battle and lost one aircraft carrier each. Technically, it was a draw, but the Allies claimed victory because the Japanese withdrew. While both sides were licking their wounds, the Japanese decided to make a surprise attack on Sydney. In late May 1942, several Japanese midget submarines penetrated Sydney Harbour and created chaos. Torpedoes just missed USS Chicago, but managed to sink the former ferry, HMAS Catabon. Unfortunately, 21 Australian and British sailors died when Catabon was sunk. As an aside, Ron Gordon and Ted Elias had their kit stored on Catabon after they went to jail, and it went to the bottom of the harbour. As a result, they lost all their personal belongings. While the war raged in the Pacific, Bird Everett flew from the US to Britain to lobby Winston Churchill. Curtin and Churchill had been at loggerheads over the recall of Australian troops from the Middle East to defend Australia. Everett's job was to soothe the waters and get some planes to help in the defence of Australia. Churchill only promised a squadron of Spitfires and it would take nearly a year before they arrived. Everett came back to Australia in late June empty-handed to face the High Court decision. The High Court finally handed down its decision on 8 July 1942. All four High Court justices rejected the lawyer's appeal. They held that British military law validly applied after the Governor-General's transfer order in 1939 and the death sentence was confirmed. Everett briefed Cabinet the same day. Cabinet put him in charge of finding a face-saving solution. Everett immediately ordered his two senior advisers to find a way out of the mess. His chief of staff was Alan Dalziel, seen on the left, the taller of the two men. His departmental head was Sir George Knowles on the right. They worked on a range of legal options. The first option was to ask the British to change their rules to avoid the death sentence. However, the British were simply not prepared to change the rules to help two Australian murderers. An Australian exempt exemption would create a nightmare for the Royal Navy, which had multiple nationalities serving in their warships. They accounted that the Australian government needed to change its own legislation. It was a diplomatic standoff. This forced 
Dalzell and Knowles to look at alternatives. In the end, the legal advice was clear. The only quick and clean way to avoid the death sentence was to seek royal clemency. The Labor government was initially reluctant to go cap in hand to the King, but it had no choice. Fortunately, King George VI was sympathetic. He wanted to keep Australia in the Empire and was more than pleased to help. So on 11 August 1942, George VI commuted the death sentences of Ron Gordon and Ted Elias to life imprisonment. Sorry. Sorry, I just got a hiccup with the slides. Both Ron Gordon and Ted Elias were obviously extremely relieved to hear about royal clemency. The sting in the tail, though, was that they were transferred to the old colonial prison at Goulburn for the rest of their lives. Their lawyers, friends and family were not to pre prepared to accept this outcome. They still firmly believed there'd been a miscarriage of justice. While the legal and diplomatic battle played out between Melbourne, Canberra and London, HMRS Australia was involved in the first Allied offensive against the Japanese in the Pacific. The combined Australian and US fleet landed an invasion force of 11,000 US Marines on Guadalcanal. While the land offensive initially went smoothly, the Japanese struck back in a surprise night attack and sunk the Canberra and several US cruisers. Once again, HMAS Australia was lucky to miss the action. Back in Canberra, Everett was so furious about the lack of Australian control over its own ships that he decided to adopt the Statute of Westminster. This was a huge gamble as the Conservative opposition led by Robert Menzies, which had the numbers in the Senate, had refused to adopt this legislation before or during the war. They didn't want to cut the, ap the apron strings with Great Britain. It was only after a secret briefing of Parliament about what had happened on the flagship that Everett was able to get the numbers to adopt the legislation. This meant for the first time that Australia was legally independent of Great Britain. While Everett was playing politics in Canberra, the Allies stopped a Japanese attack over the Kokoda track and launched a counter-offensive. However, HMAS Australia was ordered to stay behind the Great Barrier Reef. On the flagship, the sea inside the reef was disparagingly known as the Cabbage Patch, and they called themselves Curtain's Koalas. They did not know it, but they were being kept in reserve for a future offensive. It was at this point that Trevor Kat Rapke was forced to retire and Harold Farncombe was ordered to Britain to train on aircraft carriers. Trevor Rapke had been in the front line for 366 days and he was suffering from battle stress and a severe case of dermatitis. But, but he remained determined to help Ron Gordon and Ted Elias. As the war dragged on and Ron Gordon and Ted Elias remained locked up in Goulburn, the prisoners' family and friends decided to escalate their campaign to free the two men. Elias's mother, now Christina Byrne, engaged a Sydney criminal lawyer, Mervyn Finlay, and he wrote letters for her to send to a wide range of opinion leaders to get support. Finlay also arranged for media coverage to influence public opinion and put pressure on the government to free the two prisoners. The campaign to engage key opinion leaders paid off. The Anglican Bishop of Goulburn, Ernest Bergman, nicknamed the Bushman Bishop, and the Catholic Cardinal of Sydney, Norman Gilroy, both lobbied Evett to do more to release the men. As it turned out, Bergman was a close personal friend of Abbott and Alzeel, and he was able to influence them. 
to end the lobbying, Evett decided to hold a secret judicial inquiry into the case. In January 44, he appointed New South Wales Supreme Court Justice Alan Maxwell on the right in the photo with his son on the left to review the evidence. Harold Farncombe and Trevor Rapke both attended. Former Navy Minister Percy, Percy Spender helped to defend the sailors. After a five-day hearing in Sydney, Maxwell decided that, firstly, the men were guilty as charged. Secondly, however, Harold Farncombe's personal comments about the men's guilt to a panel of more junior officers could have influenced them and was inappropriate and mitigating circumstances should have been considered. Maxwell recommended reduced sentences but did not specify what they should be. The lack of clarity in the Maxwell ruling fueled a long-lasting legal battle. The Attorney General's Department in Canberra wanted to free the sailors as early as possible, but the Navy office in Melbourne was to keep them in jail as long as possible. They argued for years over the technical legal details about how the Maxwell ruling should be implemented. Sir George Knowles eventually retired and became Australia's High Commissioner in South Africa. Everett also lost interest in the case and focused on his new project at the end of the war, the United Nations. In their absence, Alfred Nankervis, the Secretary to the Navy Office, continued to argue against early release. It was not until 1949, seven years after the murder and well after the war, that a breakthrough occurred in the legal battle. Judge Alfred Rainbow, president of the Prisoners' Aid Association in New South Wales, found that the Maxwell ruling had been misinterpreted in Canberra. The Attorney General's Department initially thought that good behaviour reductions in the men's sentences would not apply. But Rainbow, Rainbow approached Maxwell and confirmed this was not his intention and the men should have had the benefit of good behaviour. The new head of the AG's department, Sir Kenneth Bailey, confirmed this was the case and advised the Navy office. The Navy board finally agreed that the men could be released and they walked free from Goulburn Jail in September 1950. Only one week later, Ted Elias, this is the only picture of him we have, married a pre-war girlfriend, Jean Harrison. Ted and Jean are on the right in this photo. He also changed his name to Ted Alice and joined a secret community organisation, the Independent Order of Oddfellows, to help build a new life. He eventually passed away in 1988 at the age of 70. Ron Gordon also married twice and also lived a long and happy life. That's Ron on the left. There is little doubt that Ron Gordon and Ted Elias murdered Jack Riley. The bottom line is they did the crime and they served their time. However, their post-war marriages do raise some doubts about the motive for the crime. This leaves us to speculate about the homosexual motive for the crime and to debate the legal and political fallout. I would now be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. That was very interesting. Um, now, if anyone's got any questions, if they could put it up on the chat there and I will uh, read them out. In the meantime, just to start things rolling, um, what exactly is the Statute of Westminster? Yes, good question, uh, uh, Brent. Uh, the Statute of Westminster was uh, proposed by the British government uh, after the uh, First World War. Uh, the Dominions, uh, South Africa, Canada, Australia, um, had all uh, you know, contributed significantly uh, to the victory in World War I. And 
uh, the problem for the British was that the Dominions now wanted their just uh, rewards. They wanted more freedom uh, from Great Britain. They wanted to be legally independent from Great Britain. They wanted to run their own uh, um, diplomatic uh, affairs. Un under the British legislation, the British controlled all that. Eventually, uh, the British government in 1931 approved its own statute of Westminster, uh, giving the power to each dominion to adopt the legislation and become legally independent of Great Britain. However, Australia and New Zealand both declined to adopt the legislation. They saw it as an affront to the mother country and they decided that they wouldn't, uh, they, they were happy that uh, their legislation would be subordinate to British legislation. This resulted in the conundrum uh, that we saw in World War II uh, when Australia didn't have the power to overturn the British military decision on the death sentence. So the, the adoption of the Statute of Westminster in Australia under the Labor government was the first time that Australia became legally independent and it was able to adopt its own independent foreign policy from Britain. Does that answer your question, Brent? It does, thank you. Now we have a question from Tony Nagy. What made it, uh, motivated you, Robert, to write the book? Thanks for the Dorothy Dix, uh, Tony. Um, look, I've, I've always been passionate about uh, Australian history, um, particularly uh, issues that drive much bigger change in the nation's future. The more and more I got into this story, though, and the more I talked to the families, the descendants, the, the descendants, uh, the ancestors of uh, the main characters, the more I became personally engaged in the story on their behalf. And the more I actually wanted to finish this book so that they could have their views represented uh, about what they thought about the story. Um, Carol Woods, who's the great niece of Jack Riley, uh, her family were destroyed uh, by the death of, uh, of Jack. Um, they lived in shame for 60, 70 years. And it's only now that they feel as if the story's finally been told. Giles Yates, a friend of Ron Gordon, still believes that there was a miscarriage of justice and he still wants to sustain the reputation of Ron Gordon. It's these personal stories that drove me to finish the book. And I hope that these personal stories add much more value to the story. Um, I'll ask another question. I'm always, always curious to know why the Royal Australian Navy opposed the, uh, the release. It seemed a bit bloody minded. <laughs> well, um, Essentially, during the war, it was justified on the basis that um, they didn't want to undermine morale. They, wanted, they were sentenced to life imprisonment. They wanted that sentence to be sustained as a signal for discipline in the Royal Australian Navy. While the war was ongoing, you could understand the Royal Australian Navy and the Navy Board arguing that position. But once the war ended, that no longer applied. I think it became bloody mindedness and a bureaucratic battle with the Attorney General's Department that delayed a resolution. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure about quite what, what, what this is a, a question. Maybe it's something for comment. Evett Iron, EPS says, Evett ironically wrote the book, The King and Its Dominions in 1936, a classic of constitutional law. Doesn't ask whether you agree with that. No, he did write it, and he was a supporter of the adoption of the Statutes of Westminster, and it was formal Labor Party policy to adopt the statute, but as you'd appreciate, they didn't get into power until um, the war started, and they had much bigger issues to fry. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, the incident on HMAS Australia gave uh, Everett the opportunity to adopt the Statute of Westminster and he used that opportunity to full effect. 
So, are there any more any more questions, Dorothy Dixes or otherwise? <laughs> oh, here we go. Andrew Andrew Boatman. Rapke went on to senior rank. He's also he also had strong religious connections. Robert mentions intervention by Anglican and Catholic leaders. What impact, if any, did religious sensitivities have on the appeals processes? Well, that's a very good question. Rapke uh, uh, did go on to, uh, he stayed in the Navy and was, uh, was offered uh, the rank of uh, Rear Admiral um, when he was, he became uh, the Adjutant General uh, of, uh, uh, in the legal corps for the Navy after the war. Uh, so um, his strong defence of uh, uh, the two sailors was not held against him and he, and he did go on to quite a meritorious career, both legally and in the Navy. Um, uh, yes, he did have strong religious connections. I don't think that that uh, had any impact on his defence. Having spoken to his son, Jeremy Rapke, um, Jeremy's got in his chambers in, uh, uh, in Melbourne has a, uh, a plaque on the wall that says justice, justice, forever justice. This was something that um, uh, Trevor Ratke personally believes strongly in and Jeremy believes that's what drove him to defend the two sailors. Um, it was a, a, a masterstroke to get uh, the, Catholic Arch, uh, um, the, Ca the Catholic Archbishop and uh, uh, the Anglican Archbishop involved in the case I'm not sure they knew that uh, Ernest Bergman was a personal friend of Evett uh, and Dalziel or not, but it did pay instant dividends and it did result in uh, Evett calling the Maxwell Inquiry. We have another question from Tony Nagy. Any doubt about the alleged murderers, Robert? Well, look, I, yeah, thanks, Tony. I, I do think that's a a really important question. Um, my belief is that having read through all the uh, transcripts of the court martial, the transcripts of the High Court case, and the transcripts of the Maxwell inquiry, the circumstantial evidence was overwhelming. And at the end of the day, Justice Maxwell reaffirmed the guilty verdict. However, it was simply based on circumstantial evidence. There are those who still remain to this day convinced that the circumstantial evidence wasn't strong enough to convict the two, the two sailors. So it will be something that remains in doubt for many people, despite the fact that it went through three legal processes and an independent judicial inquiry confirmed their murder. And a follow up. Um, Australia had the death penalty. So what drove the reason for the Curtin government and Evett to oppose? Well, that's true. Um, uh, Australia did have, uh, uh, Australian states, various Australian states did have the death penalty. Although in practice, Queensland and New South Wales under Labor governments didn't enforce the death penalty. Um, the ALP at a federal level uh, had always adopted uh, uh, opposition to capital punishment. Um, they had long-standing opposition to the death penalty um, and uh, they simply uh, were not prepared to accept the death sentence for, for Gordon and Elias. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why they opposed it. Question from Virginia Stanhope. Was there any other evidence provided Look, um, you'll have to read the book, Virginia. <laughs> uh, there's quite a lot of detail. Um, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that placed both Gordon and Elias at the scene of the crime. They were covered in blood, um, uh, which was uh, explained by uh, trying to help uh, uh, Elias uh, to the sick bay to treat his wounds, but no one simply believed them. Their story was implausible. Um, the route they said that they were going to take to the sick bay was circuitous. Um, and others took uh, 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 um, Jack Riley quickly to the sick bay 
uh, when uh, when they didn't do it. So no one believed their stories, uh, but there was a lot of other supporting evidence. But once again, it was all circumstantial. I don't think it was uh, Virginia. I think it was someone else. Ah, uh, well, I can't. I can only read what's <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh. Tony Nagy again. Any basis for the allegation of a gay group on board? Yeah. Look, um, once again, Tony, you, you must have read the book. This is a, a this is a really important question that goes to one of the most difficult issues that I had to deal with in the book. Um, the investigation by uh, the executive officer, uh, Blackjack Armstrong, um, was conducted under third degree interrogation. There's some doubt about whether the sailors were regurgitating fact or myth. But on the basis of that uh, investigation, uh, Armstrong concluded that there was a group of sailors. He named three of them in addition to uh, Gordon and Elias in a memo that was never circulated past Farncombe. It was buried in the National Archives for over 70 years and has only recently seen the light of day. The Royal Australian Navy and former Royal Australian Navy uh, officers urged me not to name those other sailors uh, in, the, in, the, in the book. However, because there were so many dark secrets in this story, I, was, I felt compelled to lay on the public record in my book what was only stated in the National Archives. I didn't put all of their, their full names in the, in the book, just how it was laid out in the Armstrong memo. But I also felt compelled to go back and dig into their lives and to find out what their service records were like and also what their um, post-war life was like. What I found about these other three sailors was that they had exemplary service records. They also, like the Gordon and Elias, all got married and all had children after the war. So once again, this cast doubt about the homosexual motive and the homosexual rumours on the boat. Having said that, there are some academics in uh, Queensland who have done some excellent research uh, on homosexual behaviour amongst our armed services in the Second World War. What they found was that in many instances, particularly amongst sailors who were locked up for months, sometimes years, in tin cans on, on the ocean, engaged in what was called situational sex or blowing off steam. They weren't homosexual, but they did practice it was, uh, sex with other men. It was the only way that they could relieve the tension. But when they went back home after the war, they uh, returned to their normal lives and no one knew any different. Thank you. Now, this, this is um, more testimonial than a question. Um, Robert, it's a great presentation and I have an old mate, brackets 96, who served in the Merchant Navy in the Atlantic, dot, 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 and a journalist, uh, Bill Guy name. He'll love the book. Thank you. Well, pleasure. I'm glad that you enjoyed it and I hope others uh, enjoy it as well. So um, happy to ask, answer any other questions. Another but from Marcus to everyone, Marcus Fielding. Thank you, Robert and Brett. Very interesting. Well done. Thanks for the positive feedback. So is, are, are there any more um, questions? So thank you very much for, uh, from us, Robert. Uh, I'll just put my own. Um, you're all right, you're up, mate. Yeah, I am up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit hard to tell actually, doing the, doing the now I can tell. Um, so a little bit of business from us. 
in the next couple of days, we'll be sending out an email with a link to Robert's website. And again, we will do another three minute feedback. Um, please help us by filling us out. It's the only way we know we're, how we're going and uh, hopefully my scores will improve. Um, Robert's will be great, have no doubt about that. Um, just for other MWHV business, we have a, a, another speaker presentation on the 11th of November at 7 p.m. by Peter Monteith. Uh, it won't have escaped your attention that this is Armistice Day, but I've been assured that there's no military history clashes that night. And why am I pushing it forward so quickly? Well, I, we're wanting to fit another one in before uh, Christmas, so I needed to move things up a little bit. Um, there'll be more information on that when that comes available. Um, just a little bit about what Peter Monteith uh, is writing about and who he is. He's Professor of History at Flinders University in Adelaide and has written a book about the defence of Crete in May 1941 titled The Battle of 42nd Street, War in Crete and the Anzac's Bloody Last Stand. This concentrates on the World War II battle in Crete when a unit of German mountain troops stormed the Anzac defensive line on what was known as 42nd Street and were decimated, that's the Germans that is, after being counter-attacked by Australian and New Zealand troops with bayonets fixed. So that'll be a very interesting topic. Um, in addition, we also have a one-day conference planned for Saturday the 20th of March next year at the Royal Historical Society rooms in the city. We'll let you know further about whether we can do that and COVID distancing and all those sorts of things. The topic will be Bloody Beachheads, the Battles of Gona, Buna, and Sandin, Sen, oh, I can never say that, Sandinenda. The committee and I wish you all good night on behalf of the MWHV and thanks again, Robert. And thank you all for joining us and we hope you come again. Good night to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity, Brent. Pleasure. Yeah. Right. Thank you.